All set? Yeah. Good to go. Good evening and welcome to the Suffrage School Committee meeting of Tuesday, May 22nd, 2012 <laughs> at 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item two, public input. If there's anyone from the audience that wishes to address the school committee, please come to the podium, state your name and address. Eleven oh five, Lebanon Hill Road. Um, I'm also this year's elementary PTA president. Um, I'm coming to you today because I um, received word this morning that. Um, at the new middle high school, there's some discussion of reducing um, the nurses to one nurse rather than um, the two that are currently at one at the middle school and one at the high school. Um, I felt this was an issue that would be important to the elementary school parents to be made aware of, um, so I posted it on the PTA Facebook page. Um, within an hour and a half of that, I had about 15 responses of very concerned parents um, wanting to know what that meant for their kids um, in the future going into the new middle high school. Um, after about two hours, a petition had been placed on change.org by um, a Mallory Jimenez. She has a son in the district and um, she is a PTA member. Um, she was unable to be here tonight, so she asked that I would read the petition. Um, so these, the following will be her words verbatim. Currently, Southbridge has two separate school nurses for the junior high and senior high. Next year, the new school building opens and these two schools will be connected. The Southbridge School Committee is currently considering cutting the second school nurse position, leaving one nurse in charge of all seven grades. The federal guideline call for one school nurse calls for one school nurse for every 750 students. The new school will hold approximately 1,000 students. <clears throat> if you were to compare a school nurse from 40 years ago, she was someone who usually waited for a student who needed a Band-Aid, says Nancy Spradling, Executive Director of the California School Nurses Association. That is not the case now with so many childhood ailments plaguing our children. As a mother of an asthmatic child, I want to know that if my child or any other child is in need of medical assistance, there will always be a school nurse to aid him immediately. It is estimated that between 10 to 12 percent of all children have asthma. This would mean that in the new junior senior high school, there will be approximately 100 to 120 asthmatic children. I would even go as far as guessing this estimate here in Southbridge may be slightly higher. Asthma attacks can happen at any moment and require prompt and immediate attention and treatment. Only a trained medical professional can judge the severity of the child's condition and administer life-saving medicine. Many times throughout the year, my son will require daily breathing treatments during school hours to treat his asthma. There have been days I have walked into the nurse's office to pick up my child who was ill, and all nebulizer treatment stations were occupied by fellow classmates. This was in a school of about 400 students. The new school will host two and a half times that. Asthma is just one concern. 4% of all children under age 18 have food allergies. The new school may have up to 40 children that suffer from very dangerous and possibly life-threatening food allergies. It is estimated that 5.6% of all children require medication to be administered during the school day. This would mean that one school nurse would possibly be in charge of administering a minimum of 56 individual doses of medication per school day. This could potentially raise the risk of misadministration. That also leaves a long list of unmentioned ailments that children suffer from, such as diabetes and epilepsy. Medical emergencies and injuries are frequent occurrences. Daily sicknesses are plentiful and require attention. Let's also add in the yearly eye ear exams, the physicals, and the daily paperwork for each child interaction. The town currently has two separate nurses at the two schools to handle the current junior high and senior high student population. I am asking that these positions remain in place at the new combined school. 
Some may argue that other schools ignore the 1 to 750 ratio. I do not believe that. Because others have made that questionable choice, it makes it right. The federal guideline is in place for a reason, and I do not believe it is to be ignored. I want us what is best for our children, and so should you. Gambling with our children is not an acceptable action. Traffic lights are usually installed after an accident has occurred. Let's not use that same mentality when dealing with the lives of our children. The health and safety of our children should always remain our top priority. Please sign and join me in persuading our current school committee to meet the federal guideline and by doing so ensure our children the safe environment they deserve. And I checked the website, it's on change.org, um, the petition in its entirety. As of 643, 37 people had signed the petition and it had only been online since 2.30. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. We will definitely take a look at the um, federal, if it is a federal mandate, and take a look at it and address it. There's nothing more important to the school committee or the committee than the safety of our children. We all have children that, three of us have children that are in that high school and will be in that high school next year. So all children are important and we would uh, definitely not jeopardize that and we will take a look at the federal mandate if it is in fact a mandate. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the school committee? Good evening, Brent Abrahamson, 26 Franklin Terrace. Thank you for this opportunity to address the Southbridge School Committee. And first, let me state that I'm not looking for answers from the school committee this evening, but I am seeking answers. I imagine like most of us, the citizens of Southbridge, my knowledge about the schools comes from two sources, public access television, and our local newspaper, the South Bridge Evening News. I want to convey to you the thoughts of this citizen as I watched the last school committee meeting on May 8th. One of the items that came up during the superintendent's report was the recent mercury spill at Wells Middle School. During that time, a school committee member criticized a science teacher by name for statements made by that teacher to the newspaper. This certainly got my attention because I thought this was very unusual. There was further banter between the superintendent and the school committee member, and reference was made to this science teacher as being the department chairman as well. The banter continued, and reference was made to the new science department chairman. That produced other questions in my mind. Did the teacher singled out by the school committee person for public criticism quit? Was he replaced as the science department chair? Well, perhaps I'd get some answers during the superintendent's report with the agenda item mark staffing update. But that wasn't to be either because the superintendent said that in the interest of time, he would not read the names of the changes in staff. Whether the science teacher had resigned or had his chairmanship taken away may have been part of that report, but we viewers were not given that information. Then I recalled that the science teacher was also the same person I read about in a Southbridge News article concerning a grievance that had been filed by a former teacher who believed he had been wrongfully dismissed. The science teacher was listed as the head of the Southbridge Education Association. In light of the statements made at the last school committee meeting, I had to wonder if this science teacher was indirectly being punished for his involvement in union activities. I want to state without any ambiguity that I, have, I don't know the answer to these questions I do not know the science teacher involved. He could be sitting here tonight, and I wouldn't recognize him. I did wonder, though, whether the public singling out of a teacher for criticism by name at a school committee meeting was acceptable. Was it ethical? Then I recalled at the same meeting, 
a citizen brought up the school committee code of ethics, and she questioned the chairman about the enforcement of the school committee code of ethics, and she was told the public does that through their votes. That seems at odds with the manual, which charges the chairman with the responsibility of properly conducting the meetings of the school committee. One would assume that would include ethical conduct as well, because the school committee chairman is the official spokesman for the school committee. I will take that this is the official position of the Southbridge School Committee. In light of this, I want to appeal to our local community newspaper, the Southbridge Evening News. You are the eyes and ears of the community. As a constitutionally guarded free press, we citizens look to you, our watchdog, to ask the tough questions. You are charged with questioning those in power for those of us who have no power. Will you do it? Finally, I would request that the South Virginia Evening News ask each of the candidates for school committee running in this election cycle one question. Do you believe that the school committee is responsible for enforcing its own code of ethics? <laughs> this citizen, for one, will not vote for any candidate who answers no. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Abramson. Is there anyone else from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, seeing none, roll call, Mr. Secretary. I'll call the meeting to order, then roll call, please. Mr. DiGregorio? Present. Dr. Domenico? Present. Mr. Jovian? Present. Mr. Lazo? Present. Dr. O'Leary? Yes, present. Mr. Mrs. Principe? Present. Mrs. Woodruff? Present. Seven, present. Thank you. Consent item warrant number 41 in the amount of $55,691.41. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions on the warrant number 41? Seeing none, roll call. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Domenko? Yes. Mr. Jovan? Yes. Seven, yes. Thank you. Approval of minutes. The regular school committee meeting of April 24th, 2012. Is there a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. Mr. Principal, any second? Second's fine. Thank you. Any errors, corrections, or omissions? Seeing none, all those approved? In favor? Unanimous all present. Item two, regular school committee meeting of May 8th, 2012. Is there a motion? So, so moved. Second. Any errors, corrections, or omissions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous all present. Reports, representative of the Student Advisory Committee, Ms. Helena Benoit. Uh, Helena's term has come to a conclusion on the school committee. I'd like to thank her for her service to our committee and wish her the best of the luck as she uh, leaves uh, Southbridge High School and graduates uh, next weekend and moves on to the Mass College of Pharmacy. Uh, she will be missed. She was a great asset to this committee. Absolutely. Presentations? We have no? We have no presentations. Thank you. Report of the superintendent, is there any report? Uh, I have no report. I will hold off on any updates on the other issues until we get to unfinished business. Thank you. Report of the business manager, do you have any report? No report, I think. Most of my items are under actions. Thank you. School committee actions. Move that the Southbridge School Committee adopt the school mill prices as proposed by the school business manager for the 2012-2013 school year. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? For the public's uh, uh, benefit, the prices currently are uh, milk is 50 cents. Proposed for next year will be the same. Elementary breakfasts are currently free. They will be 50 cents. Middle school, high school breakfast was a dollar. The proposal is middle school, high school breakfast at 125. Adult breakfast was two dollars. The adult breakfast proposed is 225. Elementary lunch is $1.75 currently, will be moved up to $2. Middle school lunch, middle school high school lunch will be, it is $2 currently, will be raised to $2.25. Adult lunch will be moved from $3.75 to $4. And the Trinity lunches will go from $2 to 
The reason uh, Trinity is at 225, I believe, is the agreement that we had that we would hold the prices the same as the middle school, high school, and that's why they are at that, even though they have a uh, elementary and a middle school component. Any, any further discussion? Mrs. Woodruff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think, I believe Mr. Wiggins had told us that the state requires the price to be $2.46. That's what the state requirement is. Actually, the federal government is the one making that requirement. The federal government. And I believe a couple of years ago we had raised the prices because of that also. And here we are raising them again, yet we're still not up to the $2.46. Um, my opinion or my recommendation would be even though parents as myself who has a child who pays for lunch don't, wouldn't necessarily want it, but I would suggest that we raise it to the 50 cents so that we're at the, the federal government price so that we don't have to go and do this again in another couple of years when they change it again. Mr. Um, that's certainly an option, and we did, uh, the Food Service Director and I discussed that. I discussed it with the superintendent. The federal rules do allow you to progress to that point as long as you do it by at least a, an average 10 percent increase. And we really felt that to try and mitigate the, to try and spread that increase out and, and spread the pain, if you will, over a few years, that we opted to recommend to you the 25 cents versus moving fully to that $2.50. Um, some districts have done that um, to get the pain out of the way all at once. That certainly is an option. I, I'd like to add one thing, and this is my own political statement for the night. Uh, recent uh, proposals at the federal level have a substantial cut in federal lunch programs. There is a proposal right now in Washington that will uh, significantly reduce the um, number of students that can qualify for free or reduced lunch mm -hmm. if that legislation passes with the new budget. Uh, that's going to have a dramatic effect in communities such as Southbridge. And, and, uh, uh, I would, I would uh, say that's something we might want to actually consider taking a position on, uh, something that actually matters uh, for kids uh, and, and our families. Because if, if the federal government changes the guidelines for free and reduced lunch and significantly more kids uh, become, become ineligible for free and reduced lunch, we will have significantly more kids coming to school hungry and staying hungry because they can't afford lunch. So that's my political statement for the night. I know I sound liberal, right? Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call. Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mrs. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Domenico? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Seven, yes. Yanis, yeah, all present. Move that the Southbridge School Committee authorize the district to sponsor the summer meals program from the town of Southbridge for the summer of 2012. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Again, I, if I may. So, Mr. Wiggins? Uh, again, I would strongly urge that the committee consider doing this um, this summer. Uh, we feel that we're on the verge of making this a break even project. Um, the state is very invested in this. It's very important to um, the, the youth. And again, the statistics we showed you is there was a dramatic increase in the meals served. Um, and uh, the state, uh, again, just today was emailing me with some things that, again, they're very interested in helping us make this a very successful program. So I would strongly urge the committee to support this. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. <clears throat> With all due respect um, to the business manager, I just want you to know that I'm going to be voting no tonight. Um, this is a program that has been running in the red, uh, and I voted uh, no first. I voted yes uh, just to give it another year, and then I know personnel changes. Uh, I cannot support uh, a program that's running in the red when we cut out a program that's running in the green. So I think that uh, to balance, I think that uh, if, uh, if it was profiting, I would be in favor of it. I just think the taxpayers of Southbridge um, are bearing enough. They're going to take another 4.5% tax hike in Southbridge. And those, uh, those taxpayers somehow need a break in uh, funding programs. Um, and I know everybody says, well, it comes from the state. Well, we are the state. We are the federal government. We are the locals. 
So just as a, as a heads up, I think that uh, it, it running in the red for the, so many consecutive years, I think it's time to, uh, to call it a day on this one. Thank you. Mrs. Principal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you to Mr. Wiggins, you said you felt that this year coming up, we may break even with that program. And I just, if you could tell the community and remind us, um, I know we were in the red last year by approximately $2,000. About $2,600. About $2,600. And prior to that, we were in the red. Prior to that, you were in the red, uh, I believe, in the in excess of $10,000 and substantially more before that. So there's been substantial improvement. But one of the things, if we break down last year, in the month of August, you were in the, in the red 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, it was, so, so you were, the month of July, there was about a $2,300 loss. In the month of August, when some of those new sites really got up and running and were really running very effectively, about $300. But the other thing that happened, and again, these are things we found out in some of our meetings this year is that we cut off our biggest site, okay, two weeks early, which was a closed site. This, this was a site, the YMCA, it was a camp where those kids had nowhere else to get the meals um, because we thought we had to. And we have since been informed we didn't need to. And I believe that actually in the month of August we would have broken even or, or even turned a slight profit we now know that we can start earlier, we can run longer. We've also begun to identify those sites and targeted those sites and how they're successful. And we are working with folks. And again, the model has changed. In those early years, which admittedly, and I absolutely agree um, with um, School Committee uh, Lazo on this, you lost a lot of money because the model was not only where you were preparing the food, you were serving the food. And there wasn't always activities to bring the students to those those sites. It absolutely was a losing proposition. If we were continuing that model, I absolutely agree. The model has evolved, and the the folks who are running those sites are actually doing the service. And there are events that the police, that the Y, that the library, uh, in some cases our own schools are putting on to attract the students there to make them viable sites and high service sites. So. Um, that's why I think it's, it's a program obviously important to those youth, um, but it's also a program that I think is on the verge of becoming a successful program. I agree. Thank you. And, and if I'm not mistaken, also we had such an increase in the number of meals served last summer, just I believe under 10,000 meals. About 3,000 meal increase in one year. Just under 10,000. Yeah, yeah. Went, from, went from about 6,700. Uh, not quite 3,000. It went from about uh, 6,700, if I remember, to just under 10,000. Thank you. Mr. Degagor? Uh, I'd, like I'd like to ask the business manager uh, to do me a favor, mm -hmm. okay? About 90% of the time when we discuss things like this, we, we tend to scratch the surface and say, you know, uh, it's making money, it's not making money, it's in the red, it's in the black. But we never really discuss, you know, a couple minutes ago you said, that we're, you know, we're verging on the edge of success. Exactly what is this program? We talk about it mm -hmm. like everybody understands what this is. And I would pretty much bet the farm that 90% of the people don't understand what this is, nor do they understand the definition of success when it comes to a program such as this. I understand that we've been running in the red. Mm -hmm. But I also like to understand how many people does this impact? What, what population of this town does this impact? Uh, what benefits does this bring to the town when the, and to the populace of the town? Because the town is the populace. It's, those are excellent questions, and I'll have to admit that I have to answer statistically because I kind of came in in the middle of the program last summer, as you, you all know. But I will tell you it's a program, summer meal programs that I have run in the past and that run here, largely impact those folks, those children, okay, who are eligible for free and reduced meals and who quite frankly are children who may, just as during the school year, they may oftentimes go hungry if not for the breakfast and lunch that we serve them during the school year, would equally in the summer go hungry 
if not for the breakfasts and lunches that we serve them through the summer meals program. That is the really the core uh, premise of the program. I think success is obviously measured a couple of different ways, and I would, as business manager, measure it two ways. The first way I would measure it, quite frankly, is in the number of children we are able to serve. Because I think first and foremost we are about children, and I think everybody on, on this rostrum agrees with that. I don't think we ever are in disagreement about the fact that whatever we do, we're about children. But there is a second measure that we do have to be cognizant of because we also have a fiduciary responsibility to the people of Southbridge, and that is, is it something that we can do and do at essentially a break-even proposition? And food service programs, as they are run in school districts around the state and around the country, they aren't really intended ever to make money, but they aren't intended to lose money either. And this program, admittedly, when it started off, lost a lot of money. I mean, I've looked back at those records. It lost a lot of money in a, in a small district that was ill-equipped to support that because, among other things, there are problems that you all know that went back historically that compromised your fund balance, and you simply didn't have that kind of startup cash to absorb those kinds of losses. You still don't, and that's why it's a concern. But the progression, both in the number of students served and in the reduction of those losses has been dramatic on, it's in the right way for both of those things. We're serving more students, we're reducing, we're reducing those losses, and I really do think we're on the verge of both success in number of students served and success in having this be a break-even proposition. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Dabinko? Yes. Mr. Jovan? Yes. Mr. Lazo? No. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Six yes, one no. Agenda item C, I'm going to uh, turn the gavel over to Mr. Lazo and I recuse myself from any discussion relative to bus contracts at this time. And I do have a disclosure on file with the, uh, the um, town clerk's office relative to my wife's employment for the bus company. So therefore, I will turn this over to Mr. Lazo. Moving on to agenda item C. Move that the Southridge School Committee authorize the school business manager to enter into a three-year contract for the purposes of providing regular education school bus transportation, special ed, school bus transportation, activities and athletics transportation, and private school transportation as is required by the state law and local policies of the fiscal years 2013, 2014, 2015. Further said, contract shall not exceed an estimated value of $6,791,391 for the three-year period, except as impacted, if at all, by special education transportation, not identified in the contract specific specifications by the fuel escalation clause. If triggered or by limited number of district buses, assuming special education, field trip, or athletic transportation responsibilities. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Discussion. Terry? Um, I, I'll probably leave it to questions. Um, there is a memo where I outline the fact that um, we went out to bid. We had six folks that um, requested specifications. We did only get one response. I will tell you that uh, one of the things I think I mentioned in the memo, is, as my father said, is that it's okay to go fishing in a small pond as long as you get the right fish. Um, AA Transportation, uh, the sole bidder, has been working with the district for a number of years. Um, I have found them to be one of the most professional transportation companies I've ever dealt with. They're very responsive to our needs. And I will tell you that what I did is, when you only have one bid, before you make the decision as to whether or not you're going to go with that bid, you go out and you look and see what's happened in other bids in other districts. This was a very competitive bid based on what other districts have found out there. 
Uh, some, some districts have gone out to bid and literally next year they'll be having uh, routes that will run at like $355 a route and we will never get there in the three years of this contract. So again, I think it's a very, very fair bid. I think it's very advantageous to the district. It unifies all of our transportation under one contractor, which was one of the goals we had, which is one of the reasons I do think it was a very competitive bid. Um, the owner of AA Transportation is present if there are questions that the committee would like to ask, uh, and he's certainly willing to answer them, and I'm certainly willing to respond to questions. Any questions? If there are no questions, roll call vote. Excuse me. Yeah, so how does this compare to what we budgeted for FY13? If we are... In, in total dollars, it's going to be an increase, but the increase um, we had only been able to estimate what it was going to cost for those additional routes at the high school level. Um, I took a shot at it. My shot was a little low. So there's going to be some, some additional money that um, we're going to put in there in the regular transportation route. Now on the special ed transportation side, we're going to save a lot of money. So the net savings in overall transportation for 2013 is about $247,000. I don't have my sheet right. Net savings, you said? The net, net savings overall, all types of transportation, okay. is about $247,000. I will also say one of the, one of the concerns in as far as a specific area of transportation last year was athletic and field trip transportation. That was reduced significantly in this bid. So that was another area that got reduced dramatically as a component. So uh, again, a good news there as well, as far as the budget goes. But the net savings is, is in excess of $247,000. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, roll call. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Domenico? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Six yes, one recused. I'd like to turn the gavel back over to the chairman, Mr. Jovan. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. Item D, vote to change the previously scheduled school committee meeting on Tuesday, June 26, 2012 at 7 p.m. to the new date of Monday, June 25, 2012 at 7 p.m. This is due to the town election on the 26th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? See none, roll call. Yes. Dr. Domenico? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Seven yes. You know, as well, President. Item E, vote to approve the 2012 2013 school calendar. Is there a motion? So, so moved. Second? Second. Dr. Domenico, second. Discussion? Mr. Ely, do you? Oh, uh, Mr. Lazo? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to propose an amendment uh, on the calendar. I'd like to change the graduation date. Um, to the 7th of June for a, its first night graduation at the new high school. Um, our facility is fully air conditioned. It seats over 650. Um, we will be fully um, in the building and uh, it's been requested to do it on the 7th as a night graduation, as an amendment. Is there a second on the amendment? Second. Is there a motion and a second on the amendment, discussion on the amendment, Mr. Lazo? I would just like to comment. Uh, I'm concerned. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's something to try. I think we have to leave it up to the parents. Uh, trying it is one thing, and then after, um, let's see how it goes. I mean, there's, there's a big, let's do it inside. It's, it's an air-conditioned new building, the whole nine yards. But I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, outside graduation, but uh, the outside graduation seating would have to be at McMahon Field. So the, the discussion will go on, and I think uh, maybe uh, you know having it indoors and to actually have a comparison to what the outdoors and the indoors and stuff. So uh, that's the reason why I'm offering the amendment to the school committee to see what, what your feelings are. Uh, Mr. Lazo, uh, just a question uh, through this purpose. Uh, graduation is typically the first weekend in June. Is there a specific reason why it went to the 7th as opposed to May 31st, the Friday before the graduation date? Uh, it was requested by uh, when I went and talked about the calendar. If we went back, they would not be completed at that time, the seniors. On May? Well, no, they completed your graduation on Sunday. But so. we, would have to go, we would have to go back to the, the 31st 
Right. right. Graduation is and June. And I offered it for the 31st on the amendment and the 7th. They chose the 7th. But again, it's, it's up for discussion. I'm not, I'm suggesting it to open the discussion. The new building's coming online, so what's, what, what's the feeling? Okay. Mrs. Woodruff? I'm just curious as to who recommended it, where you got the information from. I mean, I'm, I'm a traditional person and I love the outdoor tradition of graduation and I, I'm not privy to move it for an, an indoor air condition, but um, I'm just curious as to who brought it to your attention and, and that kind of information. Mr. Lazo? Uh, we've been having tours of the high school for the last year. Uh, third, I guess uh, Saturday we had 125 people. Every week that we have a tour, it's 50, 125, 75, and the parents uh, of the younger uh, kids, kids that are like uh, in the middle school, going into the middle school or going into the high school, we're all bringing up that, well, if it's central air conditioning, why don't we have the, the graduation day indoors to try it? And I said, I like the outdoors personally, but you know, listening to the parents and uh, on the tours, they were very excited about the new facility. Um, if you get to see the whole, uh, the backstage and all the things that we have to offer and uh, the food service area with the, the front entryway and stuff, I, I, uh, I said I would bring it up. I would bring it up to the school committee for discussion. Uh, and I too am a fan of the outdoor graduation, but uh, to be fair to everybody, to put it onto the floor, let the school committee decide. Mrs. Woodruff, do you have a follow and My last question is, um, wouldn't we bring this up to the superintendent to have able to um, bring this up a little earlier? I mean, we are late in voting the calendar anyways, but uh, why wouldn't this have been brought up to the superintendent for him to be able to um, change it and maybe ask others as well? I don't know if it just was a last minute thing yesterday that it came to your attention or if it has something that mm -hmm. you had. I, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I've got a lot of things on my plate as far as the building committee and stuff, and it's mm -hmm. not that it's a last-minute thing. It's that I wish I did bring it up to Eric. To be honest with you, Eric, I, I, I do apologize. But uh, before you finalize a calendar, uh, after you finalize it, that's it. There's no second chance later. So I said I'll bring it up tonight at least to discuss it. It's no, no insult to anybody. It's just a matter of... Uh, you know, being busy and trying to, to make all these things happen for so many different people, it's, uh, it's one of those things that I said, once you get to the school committee meeting, we can have an open discussion on it. Whether we leave it there or go, I, I don't have a, feel, a strong feeling. Thanks. Dr. Jamaica. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> as far as dates go, um, Mr. Ely, um, I, I believe we have been out of compliance with graduation dates in the past few years due to state regulation that states that you cannot hold it more than two weeks before the end of the school year for everybody else. And so the, that would explain the date being moved maybe to the seventh instead of the second. If we go back into May and our school year supposedly is gonna end on 25th, the graduation really cannot be held at the end of May uh, without us being out of compliance with it with the state regulations. Correct. And I'm still not sure we're in compliance with it. It's just the corresponding date from last year. Right. That, you know, this is the first time hearing that there was a problem with it. But uh, I, I'm, I mean, I'm willing to try anything. I can tell you that when you practice graduation, you practice graduation both indoors and outdoors because you can't predict the weather. So you always have the contingency plan of having the graduation indoors, regardless of the date of graduation. Uh, I think as a high school principal or former high school principal for 10 years, I was as happy to get rid of the seniors at that point. <laughs> uh, when graduation occurred, they were happy to be gone and I was happy to see them go. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the second works for me, the seventh works for me. I have no problem with it either way. Well, I, I guess the interesting concept and something that you don't think of off the, off the bat is, you're right, Mr. Ely, that they plan for an outdoor graduation and that morning it could change to an indoor could graduation. Overnight, absolutely. And at that new facility, we're not going to really have the outdoor seating to have an outdoor graduation at that facility. So if something were to Correct. happen in the morning, I, I mean, you're talking a logistical nightmare. So Yeah, I think what you have to do is understand that when you plan graduation, you plan two graduations. You plan one indoors and one outdoors. You always have the number one choice being, in this case, outdoors. Uh, but you make that call in a timely fashion. Generally, you would make it the night before based on what the weather report says. Uh, I always, because I had night graduations, uh, even, even under the lights uh, outdoors, I always made that call at noon. Uh, and people were able to make it from one place to another. But this is unique because 
the places are a few miles apart. Right. So the parking is an issue and all those other things. So I, I don't, you know, I think you're still going to have to plan graduation both indoors and outdoors. Mr. DeGregorio? You're right. You're right that it's un unique, but it's going to be unique every year. Yeah. From now until Absolutely. forever. So we better, make, we better decide what we're going to do. Because but if you want to, if you, you want to, if you want to have an evening graduation, you know, you can have it on Friday evening. You can have it on Sunday. You can have it any evening you, you want to. Uh, you know, there are many school districts that graduate. I heard talk to one today that's graduating on Thursday night. It's been their tradition to graduate on Thursday night in Leicester. Uh, there, are, I think, some other graduate on Friday night. Some graduate on Saturday, Sunday. You know, right. I, I, I don't. I think it's. It's an argument that you could probably have forever. The tradition here has been to have it on, I believe, Sunday afternoon, uh, which is why we planned it that way. But uh, there's always a fallback plan, and, and I, I have no problem with having changing tradition. We have, we're changing the entire school district at this point. Mrs. Woodruff, did you have a question? My only, con my only concern is, is that we're changing it from a Sunday to a Friday. I know some people work on Fridays, and Sundays are a much better day to have it. Um, and if they're having relatives come in for parties afterwards. That's my only other concern, thinking about um, the majority of the families um, are working families, but that, that's just my last concern on it. Mr. Lazo. There were a lot of issues that came to play um, from different avenues, um, from the setup to the breakdown to the, to the weather. Uh, parents, you know, I said, well, what day would you want it? Uh, Friday, so I could have the weekend with my family. So incoming people took it as it would be in Friday, and then they could spend the weekend with their family if they're not from around the area, which we have some families that have extended families outside the area. But again, there, were, there was so much discussion, and, and, and I even offered, well, what if we had it at the, the, the old high school, and, and if everything works out the way it works out, uh, we can still have it outside and use the old <laughs> auditorium or the old gymnasium. Uh, I tried to put a lot of options out there just to be open to everybody's concerns and to see where it might land and, and make it comfortable for everybody. But it's, it's going to be one of those things. It's going to be a try it and, uh, and look-see. Uh, I don't think there's any perfect uh, graduation. I've been outside and ran inside many a, many a graduation. But uh, I, I think, again, just to spur the discussion to date, uh, you know, the 7th, it was just the Friday after the 2nd. It was no particular date. Um, I, I understood the finishing in May, but that was, that, that was from somebody else. But, again, to the school committee, that, that, that's what I'm offering as an amendment. Uh, Mr. Ely. The calendar has to be approved to get out into the different um, well, we have to get books to the, and we have to get the parents, parents and yep. all that. Um, you know, I, I guess some discussion with the high school staff would be in order to to see what their thoughts might be on the administration on, on that as well. Um, it definitely is a, a unique concept to, to change it. I'm not opposed to changing it, but I don't know if, if to solicit more input from the administration. Um, and timeliness, what that would buy us. Well, you don't have another meeting. Right, till, till so, so I, June, I, right? I need to get it out. Right. So I don't care if you amend it uh, on the graduation date at all, but I, I really need you to get the calendar approved uh, because I am late getting it out yeah. uh, because we were trying to match up our assessment schedule with our half-day professional developments. Uh, and and uh, it took some time to get that done because the math and the ELA were different. Right. So. Mr. Lazo? Uh, just, just, just a question. Um, so we don't have time to, say, run a survey of some sort or anything like that? No, I, 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 don't, think calendar's a, I don't think the calendar's a democratic process. Okay. I think, I think, to me, I set the calendar. I give it to you. If you want to amend the calendar, you can amend the calendar. Okay. I think you just make a decision. We can live with it either way. Okay. Okay. All right. The amendment on the floor is to change uh, the date of the graduation to Friday evening. June 7th, it was the second on that. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Dr. Domenko? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? No. Mr. DiGregorio? No. Five yes, two no. So the amendment carries. Um, so graduation would be on June 7th, Friday evening. The start date 
for school will be, the first day of school will be Tuesday, September 4th. With technology training for the new middle school and high school, August 13th through the 24th, and administrator training the 14th through the 16th. So, <laughs> is there any further discussion on the Wait motion? Add, the the first day for the staff uh, will be on the 29th of August, and then the 30th, that'll be the first day we have in the auditorium with all staff. And then that, the rest of that day and the next day is professional development with the staff. We're front loading our professional development so they can use it throughout the year. And I didn't want to start kids on that Friday, the 31st. So we decided to leave it open for staff to be in the buildings or people to take four day weekends or whatever they needed to do before Labor Day and start kids the first day after Labor Day, which is how we ended up where we are. Okay, thank you. So any further discussion on the motion as amended? Seeing none, roll call. Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? No. Mr. DiGregorio? No. Dr. Domenico? Yes. I'm sorry, did you say yes or no? I said no. Five yes, two no. Motion carries. Unfinished business, our first item on unfinished business. Um, I've asked our attorney, Kim Rozak, to be here with us this evening to discuss <coughs> or um, provide input to the committee and the public in review of the complaint filed by the citizen at uh, a meeting, previous meeting relative to um, the ethics uh, complaint that was uh, brought forward to the school committee, as well as uh, to discuss with the school committee and the public um, the arbitration decision that had been widely publicized by, um, in the public. Um, the purpose of the review on the arbitration decision is not to discuss a specific personnel matter. It is simply to provide the public with some of the information that was made available to the school committee that we can release as far as what the process of that, that arbitration was and what the school committee could have done afterwards relative to that decision and the reasons why we chose not to make um, appeals. So. What was that, Mrs. Prince? No, I said I didn't know that was on the yeah. agenda, the arbitration. Well, it was a review of the complaints. There were two complaints by Mrs. Uh, Quinney at that meeting. Mrs. Rozek, welcome. Appreciate being here. and appreciate the opportunity to try to um, assist in addressing a couple of complaints that apparently have been filed by a citizen of the town of Southbridge. Is there a particular order in which the chair would like me to address the complaints? Both are dated April 24th, 2012. One indeed does address an issue of an arbitration award and the other addresses the um, conduct of a school committee member. Uh, I guess we would go with the uh, arbitration first. And then okay, we can thank them. you very much. Thank you. Um, seeing as though I am the attorney who handled that case, I think I do have fairly good knowledge of what transpired and why things transpired the way they did, but of course I don't have any um, control over the outcome of that arbitration decision and award. Um, as a recap for folks who are not familiar with the complaint that was raised, is it appropriate for me, Mr. Chair, to um, either read or summarize that complaint? Uh, you, you can read it. She read it in public, so it would be Okay. appropriate to, to reread it. All right, thank you. It says, Dear Mr. Ely, based upon the findings of Mary Ellen Shea, arbitrator, that William Bishop, the principal of Southbridge High School, included inaccuracies, misleading or misquoted statements, and statements that are demonstrably false, open paren, findings of Mary Ellen Shea, arbitrator, in her report dated February 6, 2012, in the arbitration between SEA and Southbridge Public Schools, AAA case number 11390205510, page 54, close paren. In suspended pending, excuse me, in Mr. Jacobson's summative evaluation, the action I would like taken is that Mr. Bishop be suspended pending further investigation into these findings, the possible legal consequences of his behavior in his performance as principal of Southbridge High School. Um, this was not exactly asked of me, but I think it is important for me to point out that um, 
arbitration matters are closed. They are closed to the public. They are not open proceedings. They are closed because most of them involve disciplinary matters involving an individual. And under Massachusetts law, individuals have the right of privacy. Um, our state respects employees' personnel files. Even as a public employee, those are protected by um, the same statute that protects everyone else's, the right to privacy, which is Chapter 214, Section 1B. And moreover, they are not deemed public records under the open meeting law or under the public records law. So it's not information that can be disclosed. So these proceedings are supposed to remain confidential. Um, when I was alerted to this complaint, it also came to my attention that obviously the decision and award had been published somehow. And that's also not supposed to take place because the arbitration process, um, even if it doesn't involve a disciplinary matter, involves collective bargaining matters, which are also closed in many instances to the public. Uh, the strategies developing the contract and the interpretations of them can be made public. But in this case, it was clearly a, a, a matter that ultimately looked like discipline and therefore should not have been published. Um, I don't know how it was published, but it's disappointing to me as a lawyer that it was published. Um, so that's the first item I wanted to bring to the attention of this committee is that it should not have been published. Um, there's a number of reasons beyond what I've said, but I won't go into that. Um, following the arbitration award, the award ruled in favor of the individual and the SEA. Um, it, it is a situation where to overturn an arbitration award in the state of Massachusetts, you have to file a complaint in court. That costs money, and it costs a lot of money to represent any client in an effort to overturn an arbitration award. They are by law supposed to be final and binding. There is, of course, legal um, recourse to seek an appeal, but those are very limited, narrow grounds that I had explained to the committee. Um, that there are about three or four exceptions to accepting an award, none of which, in my opinion, seemed to be applicable to this award. Importantly, I think it's, it's imperative that people understand that arbitration awards cannot be appealed legally just because the arbitrator got it wrong. If the arbitrator makes a mistake of law, that's not grounds for overturning an arbitration award. If the arbitrator cited the facts wrong, heard things wrong, read a transcript wrong, none of those are the bases for making or overturning an arbitration award. I personally found the award to be wrong in the first half of the decision anyway, which concentrated on arbitrability. And as a result of strategy that I had brought to the table, which I discussed with the committee, I had decided that I really didn't need to bring any witnesses to this case because it should not have been arbitrable in the first place. This arbitrator should never have ruled on the merits of the case. Unfortunately, she did, and she got it wrong. She got it plainly wrong. She got it plainly wrong in the face of history in this school district where we have always observed specific rules in the contract. She saw fit to overturn the award based on an arbitrability finding. As a result of that, when I discussed the matter with the school committee, I said, well, we could still seek and an, make an effort to undertake an appeal. It's probably going to be costly, and we're probably not going to prevail. So the committee, I think, in their own minds, we discussed other options of how we would deal with compliance with the award, ultimately agreeing to do that, and taking some steps to ensure that we did it um, in the spirit of the award and to do it as best as we could. And I think the committee made that decision based on fiscal responsibility, fiscal prudence, and a decision that they weren't going to put and throw more good money after bad. The arbitration had gone forward. It was an appropriate decision to do that, but I think it was also the appropriate decision by the committee to make a decision based on financial reasons not to go forward to fight that award. So as a result of the committee's decision to refrain from expending additional money on an arbitration matter, um, we didn't appeal it, and the award stands. Um, now, this complaint doesn't really seem to take issue with the committee's decision not to appeal it, but instead has gone beyond the award and has um, apparently adopted the findings of the arbitrator and sees fit that what the arbitrator found 
should be adopted by the superintendent as the appointing authority over one of the administrators in the school district. And the individual is asking that Mr. Ely, who is the appropriate person to deal with um, disciplinary matters involving an administrator, take some action based on decision rendered in this award. I would simply point out that, as I've said, I believe very strongly that legally the case should not have gone forward to the merits of the case. It should have been decided on a contract matter that procedural um, issues had not been satisfied by the union. So had it not gone forward, there would not have, to the merits, there would not have been a need for additional witnesses to call to um, explain why the particular individual in question was not renewed as a school teacher. And um, based on my assessment of the case, I made a strategical decision not to call as a witness the principal of the high school. And so um, I also discussed with the committee at one point that it would be imprudent to um, move down an avenue of discipline vis-a-vis -vis an individual who never testified at an arbitration based on, frankly, a judgment call that I made. And um, the findings of the arbitrator are her findings and her findings only. Um, and I would point out that many of her findings and criticisms of the administrator's determination are based on her oversight of a very important fact. There's a number of statements that she makes in her arbitration award that says, well, the administrator cited certain provisions of earlier observations, but he also added on certain information that doesn't seem to be found anywhere else in the observations of the school teacher. So therefore, his observations must not be founded. They must be misleading. They must be false. When in fact, the summative evaluation, which really um, played the key role in the arbitrator's decision, clearly says right on the face of the document that the observations that are required to take place in the school district, they number four, but the um, summative evaluation shall be based on them as well as observations made throughout the school year. Those observations are not necessarily documented anywhere, and um, they are typically not. As I understand it, the observations that take place that are the formal observations during the school year are ones that the teacher is apprised of in advance, so he or she would know when they're gonna happen, and one would hope that that is when the teacher is on his or her best um, you know, footing in the classroom. Um, but the arbitrator chose to ignore, I think, the fact that the summative evaluation by its very nature was gonna take into consideration observations made throughout the year that are not written on those four pieces of paper. So um, to some degree, her, well, I would say, to whatever degree she found the administrator's summative evaluation faulty, I would find equal fault in her finding since she overlooked you know, what the role of the document was intended to be. Um, so, as I said there, we can accept the award, even though you disagree with it, make a decision that you'll accept it for financial reasons and move on, and that's what the school committee did. So, I hope I have been able to address the concerns that are raised by this person because I respect that someone who has not gone through an arbitration proceeding, somebody who has not practiced labor law, someone who is not familiar in detail with the laws of the state of Massachusetts is not necessarily going to understand what is correct, what is not correct, and what avenues are available for disciplining a person and what is not available for disciplining a person. But I am hopeful that my presentation indicates that yes, there was disagreement with the award, but again, it was implemented. But this is not the avenue to take um, issue with an administrator who was not called as a witness at this proceeding. Do the committee members any have questions? any questions about that? Mr. Lazo? Um, you deal with these arbitrations on a regular basis. Am I correct in saying that? I do. Okay. Uh, 
in comparison to other arbitrations that we have, I know Southbridge in some ways sometimes is always unique. Did our administrator do anything wrong to the point where he should be disciplined or removed? That's probably not a question that I can answer at this podium based on the fact that I didn't call him as a witness. So because I didn't call him, I guess I can't fully answer your question and say, I think he did something wrong, I think he didn't in terms of what he finally concluded in his summative evaluation. But I can tell you that based on the documents that went into evidence, and there were four observations, as I said, four formal observations, and the fact that the summative evaluation clearly states that it shall be based upon the four observations as well as any other observations uh, performed or done or uh, just casual observations of the teacher throughout the school year. That may be a principal's walk through a classroom. Uh, I can't say that he did anything wrong in terms of process. I believe all four of the observations were completed. The summative evaluation contains information from each of those four observations. He did pick and choose. He chose what he thought was significant. Um, he chose what he thought would be the basis for, I believe, a non-renewal. And I would say that while that might appear results-oriented, I would also say that that is probably what needs to be done by any administrator who has concerns about a non-PTS teacher. PTS is a teacher with professional teacher status, and under the law, after three years of serving, they then get what historically used to be called tenure, and it would be very difficult to remove them, and that is the reason why an administrator should have considerable more latitude in years one, two, and three in evaluating a teacher. And even if there are many, many good attributes, I would say that one or two poor attributes or poor characteristics might be enough to not renew. So even if he was picking and choosing the attributes that he highlighted, I would say that's not wrong. And I would say that his inclusion of information beyond the four observations is not wrong pursuant to the evaluation tool and the process. Thank you. In reference to uh, this confidentiality of the arbitration, um, if we were to find out who did that, who let it out, uh, who publicized it, what are the consequences for that legally? Well. In my opinion, if you were to learn how the arbitration award was made public, um, the party who feels harmed by the release of the award would have to evaluate his or her standing at that point. For example, there could be a few individuals or parties that might feel harmed by this. One might be the teacher him or herself about whom the award is written because there is some personal and confidential information contained in that award that um, that individual could certainly have a right to complain about. Regardless of the fact that he or she prevailed in the arbitration, there is confidential information that pertained to that particular person, so he or she could certainly um, complain, has a cause of action for re release of this public information. I'll leave it at that. Um, I think the uh, characterizations of the administrator at issues could certainly serve as grounds for his complaint because not only is this being made public when he didn't, again, have the chance to so-called defend himself or be available to testify or add to the record, um, it's clear that there is a negative impression of what took place by at least one member of the citizenry in Southbridge. I would assume that that's not just a sole opinion. So that person could also have some form of a cause of action for release of that. Um, document and if for some reason the committee were determined as a whole that it puts them in a bad light for having made decisions that they didn't think they were ever going to have to justify in a public forum because it pertains to a confidential matter, personnel issues, um, then I think the committee may also have a cause of action. So it really depends on how it affects either that body, the group, or the particular individual. Thank you. Mr. Gore. 
this is one of the things I hate about politics. And it's about, better to just win the case, isn't it? You know, <laughs> let, let me just ask you a couple questions. First of all, I find, uh, I find that whoever released this information to the newspaper, it's an odious act to begin with, and it's done with malice. It's not done with any intent to enlighten the public. It was done out of malice, in my opinion. The teacher in question had not yet gained professional status. That's correct. Okay. All, used to be called tenure. Correct. He could have simply, or she could have simply been released, period. Without Absolutely any correct. type of see you later or any reason, just released with absolutely, absolutely no correct. reason. I understand that perhaps there was any, wasn't any malice on the other side. I don't know that. I'm not privy to that, and I'm not going to make a judgment call on that. However, from everything that I have read from the state, from what's been told to me and what's been rumored, I do find there was some pretty poor judgment to go around. And that concerns me. It concerns me because, number one, we're a school district that's already in some type of distress. This is the last thing that this district needed. We have lost credibility, not only in the eyes of the public, but in the eyes of the teachers, in the eyes of the union. And you know what? I mean, it's, it's always, you know, the school committee versus the union. I mean, for, for the almost dozen years that I've been on this committee, it's always been us against them, which I find, honestly, repugnant. I really do. It seems like we're supposed to be on the same side, but we've never ever seem to be on the same side. I understand negotiating, that's what I do for a living, but it always seems that these negotiations carry on into private conversation and into back rooms and back alleys. And this is one of those situations where uh, things were done, in my mind, incorrectly. And that's in my mind. I am 100% on board with, look, this should have never got to the point where it got. Exactly what the defense would have been, that this, this whole thing came from here to here and should never have got to here because it should have stopped here. He should have, or she should have been terminated here. And that should have been the end of everything. But that's not the end of everything because it went beyond that. And that's what we had to defend, or you had to defend. And the fact that the person uh, in question that we're all talking about did not get a chance to defend himself, that does play a major role in this because fair play is part of the justice uh, system. So I understand that. But I do have to say, as a school committee member, I am extremely disappointed in the entire process, both on both sides of the bench. I understand everything that occurred, and I understand what the state did. I understand what we did. And again, I still have to, I, I, I wouldn't leave here tonight feeling uh, very good about myself if I were to say, look, you know what, we, we did everything we were supposed to do and, and, you know, yada, 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 the whole, you know, the whole spin. And that's basically uh, really all I have to offer to this. Thank you. If I could just respond, I think your point is well taken that, you know, there is an evaluation process in place. And if your point was, Maybe it could have been handled differently. I guess I would simply defer then to the superintendent on this and say, and I think that is why the state has fought, sought fit to decide that there needs to be different evaluation tool for teachers. Um, if it's standardized across the state, across school districts, I think it will be a better thing. I, I will admit that that is an area in which I need to still bring myself up to uh, a better learning level, but I am aware that some of these things are probably the reasons why 
the evaluation process needs to be standardized because each district has its own evaluation tool for teachers. Um, it's negotiated by law. Some have them in their collective bargaining agreement, some don't. This district happens to have that added to or is made a part of its uh, collective bargaining agreement, which is why it was made subject to the grievance and arbitration process to begin with. In another world, in another day, it might not be, so that the discretion of the administrator to make the decision that you're talking about, Mr. DiGregorio, at some point before the three years are up, where the teacher has served three consecutive years, the discretion should more appropriately lie with that administrator so we don't have these issues in the future. Yeah. Um, I, I'd just like to say uh, one thing about I fully respect the union and their right to bring a matter to arbitration. I don't have a problem with that at all because there are certain times that we interpret a contract one way, they interpret the contract another way, and we go to arbitration to d determine, okay, how best. We can't resolve this grievance together. We get outside party. I have no problem with it. I think that's good business because the contracts are living, breathing. They change. There's different interpretations. Administrators, I've been through five superintendents now. Each superintendent views that contract a different way. Um, the sitting superintendent for the non-renewal of that teacher is no longer with us. So we can't even get to the superintendent to say, what was your thought process? Mm -hmm. Because a principal, while the principal oversees the building, at some point we hire a superintendent for good money to oversee that process to make sure that it's followed the right way. But what, get, what ends up happening, we the elected leaders get stuck holding the bag later on in the public ridicule because of decisions that our highly paid administrators have made, whether they're right or wrong. And now our job is to fix those as an elected body, to fix those decisions and to live with them. I think I have no problem taking responsibility for the fact that this district may have done something wrong, may or may not have done something wrong in any arbitration decision or grievance process because that's how you cure those things that are wrong. My issue with this is the fact that it was made public because of some of those things that were put in there, not to the fact that, you know, uh, the interpretation of that arbitrator was the fact that she believed that not all the uh, evaluations were part of mm -hmm. that, that process. What really concerns me is the person that made that public, there were certain personal information regarding that teacher that was not even known to the district at the time of hire. And what by publicizing that matter may now do to any future employment that that gentleman may have. Okay, those are the, my issues. I have no problem with living with an arbitration decision that says, listen, Southbridge School Committee, you got it wrong. The contract says this, and this is our decision. That's fine. That's the way, that's the way it works. All right, and, and sometimes we make decisions every day that the public can't know about because of collective bargaining agreements, mm -hmm. that we make the best decision for the people of Southbridge to stop spending money that we might not be able to use. This arbitration costs us a lot of money. We're in the middle of another arbitration that's costing a lot of money because of, of, of contract issues. But we, at some point, we have to make a decision. What do we do? Do we fund that nurse for the middle school and high school that you need? Or do we fight an arbitration that we may or may not win? So we made a business decision on this. Based on that was, hey, look, we don't agree with this decision. We don't like the fact that they made it public. But it's going to cost us a lot of money to go back to court and not put those positions in place. It was a business decision. And if I was to reflect on it, if I knew that our administrator and the, and the person that was on the, even the other side, the, the employee on the other side that made that public, I would have never made that decision. I may have fought it so it wouldn't go public to protect that worker. Because mm -hmm. personally, the teacher deserves to walk away from the district one way or another with, it, with his head held high and not be put out to ridicule. So that, that's my point on that. As far as Mr. DeGuerra's point about us versus them, I've been on negotiations for seven years in this district, along with my colleagues, Mrs. Prince Bay, Mr. Uh, Dr. O'Leary, Mr. Lazo, Dr. Domenko. We worked very hard to try to forge a cooperative working relationship with those unions. 
And we may not see eye to eye, but I think afterwards we respect one another when we walk away from the table because we're all friends. We all live in this community, and we see those people every day. But I have to sit there and say, okay, I, as, a, as a school district, we only have X amount of dollars. And would I love to give 5% raises to, to teachers because they deserve it? Absolutely. But then I have to look at the overall budget and how is it going to weigh. Those are tough decisions. So it, try, I try never to make it personal. I know my colleagues don't either. Let's work what's best for the district. So, so I just want to make that point, Mr. DeGuro, because sometimes it does see us versus them. But in the end, we always try to look at what's best for the district. Any further discussion on this matter? Okay. So, Attorney Rozak, you were here earlier this evening as well, and you heard another gentleman say about the code of ethics of the school committee um, and comments. Um, I, I didn't want to get into a debate, but certainly one member's position or statement is certainly not the position of a school committee unless they take a vote. Is that not correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank yes. you. Um, the second reason I was asked to address the committee has to do with, um, uh, again, a complaint filed by a member of the citizen, citizenry of Southbridge on April 24th, 2012. And that complaint uh, reads basically as follows. I, and it's directed to the school committee this time, again, to the appropriate body who might be able to address the issue if appropriate. It says, I believe that at the school committee meeting on April 10th, 2012, school committee member Lonzo committed several violations of the school committee member code of ethics, namely 456 in relation to the community, 2 and 3 in relation to the school administration. And she references um, the Southbridge School Committee policy manual files labeled letters B, C, A, and B, B, A. I have those with me tonight, and I think the policy that is being referred to is actually B, C, A, which is entitled School Committee Member Ethics. And indeed, the um, individual does point out the numbers match. There's a four, five, and six under uh, the expectations of what a school committee member's relations will be relative to the community as a whole. And numbers two and three outline a school committee's expectations in connection with his or her relations to the school administration. So I will admit I was not here on April 10th. 2012, so I had to school myself in terms of what it was that Mr. Lazo said that might have been somehow um, offensive or in violation of the Code of Ethics. I was directed to a certain part of that um, meeting, and I was able to review um, the tape recording of what took place. And if I'm getting this right, and I haven't talked to any of the school committee members, so I hope so, ahead of time, I understand that there was a discussion that took place at that meeting relative to the purchase of a van for the food service department, or for food service. And there was a discussion about whether the budget of the food service would be paying for that, or the school committee's general budget would pay for the van. Am I right about that? Okay, and what's, what's it? I don't think that's what I think. The discussion was about the uh, the, the food line. The, I think the but yes, but, but line my, the conversation right, began but with the context. That. My understanding, and and I agree, I understood that. But my the context, and maybe I'm wrong, but the context in which I understood Member Lazo's comments to be, you know, the springboard for that was the fact that there's a budget, the school committee budget, then there's a it supposed to be or has been and is a budget for the um, food service. So why can't the food service budget afford to pay for this van? And there was discussion about that, but that dovetailed, as I understood it, into Member Lazo's comments. And he commented about, uh, as it was referred to in the school committee meeting, an express line for lunch at the high school otherwise known as the a la carte line for lunch in the high school. And having the benefit of listening to the whole thing, I now know what the outcome was, which is that 
the business manager said we have to do away with the a la carte line because of federal regulations. And in that conversation, um, Member Lazo made some statements that he initially said he was speaking as a school committee member and then at the end it was more clear to me that he was speaking as an individual who had concerns about eliminating the express line at the high school because it was a profitable um, source of income and he made a comment that if we got rid of the express line at the high school, we could lose as much as four or $500 on any given Friday because a lot of students and maybe teachers and faculty buy from that line. On the other hand, he compared it to, um, or juxtaposed that, I should say, with the fact that, as was discussed this evening, there's a summer feeding program and that's geared towards a certain socioeconomic group of people. And he was expressed frustration with the fact that we're going to maintain a um, service that has in the past been the source of losing money compared to maintaining a service that makes money. And I am assuming it was in that context that the member of the public was upset with the way he expressed himself and suggests that the, the person would like action taken in connection with these violations, that they be looked into and appropriate disciplinary action be taken. Well, uh, Member Lazo has the right to express himself as a member of the school committee and as a member of the public. Um, to either have the committee vote to censure his comments or to do something else other than that, w whatever the person is looking for, I think would be um, wrong legally. He has First Amendment right to speak. He is speaking on a matter uh, that he is aware of as a result of his role as a school committee member. And there are occasions where people express their opinion in ways that others don't disagree necessarily with the point that's being made, but they don't like the way it's said. Maybe things could have come across in a softer w way or could have been said differently, but at the end of the day, they are not comments that legally, as school committee counsel, I could see any way that the committee could correctly censure him for. And nor do I actually see them as being a foul of the school committee ethics policy because I've read all of the provisions, but to the ones that, in connection with the ones that have been pointed out as potentially being uh, trampled upon by the comments made, the school committee member is to be well informed concerning the duties of a committee member on both the local and state level. The only possibility that I could see in terms of did the committee member know everything about his or her duties would be the fact that the, it was the feds that required the express line to be eliminated as opposed to an internal decision by the um, school district. I noticed that other people at the meeting seemed to also not be aware that it was a feds ruling and Mr. Wigan pointed that out and that was appropriate. I'm not sure that that rose to the level of the committee member not understanding his duties. Um, one of the other cited requirements is that the committee member remember that he or she represents the entire community at all times. He made a statement. I, I don't see that his opinion, again, trampled upon the entire community. His point that I understood he was making was, we make money on the express line. We don't make money on other things. One of the primary roles of the school committee is to oversee the budget, plan a budget, and make fiscal decisions. Again, that was how he expressed himself. Uh, I don't see that as being in violation of that particular provision of the ethics code. And the other provision cited was, accept the office as a committee member as a means of unselfish service with no intent to play politics in any sense of the word or to benefit personally from his or her committee activities. Unless someone could explain to me better what the person had in mind in terms of the person who raised the complaint, 
had in mind. I'm not sure how anything that was expressed would be playing politics. It would be expressing an opinion. Um, and I don't see how he would benefit from it personally, whether the a la carte line continues in existence or is um, dropped until such time as the, the, the line can be uh, used as a reimbursable lunch program. So I, I, I'm just addressing this in the most general of terms. I, there could be some other thoughts that the individual had in mind, no doubt, and that could serve as a discussion point, but um, from the surface, I don't see how any of those provisions come into play. The other two were ones that relate to the school committee's relations with school administration, and those cited were recognize and support the administrative chain of command and refuse to act on complaints as an individual outside the administration. I don't think there was any, um, there was certainly, I, I didn't see in the comments that there was a, an obfuscation of the administrative chain of command. I, he brought the topic to the committee's attention and there was discussion over it. And then the next provision of the ethics code that was cited is, give the chief administrator full responsibility for discharging his or her professional duties and hold him or her responsible for acceptable results. I, frankly, I'm not even sure who the chief administrator is in this policy. I think that might be something that needs to be updated. Forgive me for saying that. But if the chief administrator is the superintendent as the CEO of the school district, uh, I don't think the comments did anything to avoid the responsibility of the superintendent for discharging his or her professional duties. Uh, if the superintendent is ultimately in charge of following the um, recommendation of the business manager, which is we've got to eliminate the a la carte line for the time being until we can introduce an appropriately um, reimbursable food program in that line, then so be it, and the superintendent's gonna do his job, and the comments made were simply, step it up. Let's try to get that a la carte line to be a reimbursable lunch program, and again, that's how I understood it. So. Um, I would be happy to accept any comments by anybody on this, but I didn't understand completely how the comments were interpreted by this particular individual as being in violation of the ethics code. Uh, no, Ms. Coney, this is a private meeting held in public. The opportunity for a member to address the school committee is at public input. She just asked if she could clarify my understanding. I, I'll admit, I said I don't really understand what the individual who made the complaint's concerns were apart from what I addressed. I can't, I'm going to have to leave that to the uh, chairman as to whether uh, he wants to engage in discussion. I, I will admit that I, I don't have a problem addressing it, but it may be out of well, order. I, I, just, I, I don't want a public debate on yep. it. I mean, uh, clarification, but the school committee will address it first. Mrs. Woodruff? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think um, what we're talking about a little bit, because I too was a little bit, um, I guess, surprised with that meeting and some of the comments made, but one of the comments was comparing some of our, our students and, and our public people as bottom end, um, meaning that somewhat of a discriminatory way that I took it. And I think that's probably part of the problem is, is the public took it in a way where um, they were described as bottom end rather than higher end, middle end, or whatever, but they were, they were called bottom end. And I believe that's where the concern uh, brought everything about. Okay. Did anybody else have anything? Mr. Lazar? Uh, there's, I have a, I, I've been in government a few years, and I was always under the impression as a school committee member that I wasn't exactly rusty at process and procedure. Um, the previous speaker, I did not make those intentions. Uh, if somebody read it that way, shame on them. Um, I'm a person that works, I'm, I'm a person that's struggling right now in business in an economy that's very tough. Um, I have poor children coming through my Pop Warner program that I pay their fee. I pay their cleats. I help people every single day. I volunteer to every monument in this town, lighting the fields, whatever it takes for my community. And we, we are a low-income community. And I chose to stay here because I am part of Southbridge. But I always looked at it as we were all one team. 
and that we were pulling all the reins in one, one area, pulling it together. Uh, we're going to have the right to disagree, but we don't have to hate each other. And some of the stuff that goes on is almost foolish, but it's just a little group and a very positive uh, outlook of a lot of things going on in the town of Southbridge. But my point in the process of procedure in the chain of command, I always understood that the people were supreme. They elected a body called the school committee and the superintendent worked for them. I do not work for the superintendent or any administrator. Uh, the finance director, uh, able and willing as an advisor to the board. We discuss finance. Finance is always a concern of mine. I do not want to run back in a deficit. Maybe you would like that, but that's not why I'm here. They brought me back to school committee so we could hold the line. They cut 68 teachers. I didn't see anybody standing here. We lost 68 teachers. I stayed on to rebuild this system with a group of people and enabled superintendents, plural, finance directors, plural, counselors, town managers. We're building a $75 million school. The Home Rule Charter is the governing document of Salisbury. I was always under the impression in the Massachusetts general laws. At the meeting, we have parliamentary procedure, which we have adopted, which controls the meeting. And the Ethics Commission in Boston, which confused me about this complaint, which I, I take it seriously if it's a serious complaint, but I couldn't uh, get it to add up because if there's an ethics violation, I'll get a call. You can call the Ethics Commission in Boston. They'll give you a ruling immediately. They'll take care of your problem for you. But a policy manual, we're a policy-making body. We, we, we're in charge of policy and budget. That's it. Administrators have a tremendous amount of power at the building level, thanks to Ed Reform. And our superintendent has a role. The chairman has a role, and as vice chairman, I have a role. I might not always deliver the message probably the way everybody likes it delivered, but my heart and soul is on this school committee and on turning this district around along with the construction projects, which is my strong point in my area that I work in. So I offer myself every three years. Some people vote against me. Some vote for me. I'm still here, and next year, They'll judge me again, and I will take the answer from the people like a champ. Whether I'm here or not, this is still a great community. And don't let a few special interest people that come from one group bother you. And that's it. Point of order, oh, excuse me, Mr. Abraham. Mr. Abraham, a point of order comes from a member of this body, not, not from a, Mr. Abraham. A point of order comes from a member of this body, not from the public. This is not a town meeting. This is a meeting of the school committee. I respect your opinion, but that was inappropriate. Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you. you very much. I'm, I'm completed. Ms. Rozak, did she give you a copy of her original letter? She gave me a copy. Unfortunately, that letter was not presented to the yeah. school committee along with the complaint. Yeah, no. So all we had was the numbers and our recollection of what she said at the meeting. The letter was not presented to the school committee, OK? Understood. What I just received is a document dated today, and it is certainly more explanatory, and the individual has uh, clearly articulated her basis for why she thinks um, each of the sections of the school committee ethics policy has been in violation. Um, it, and while I completely respect her opinion, I think to some degree it is an effort to shoehorn into a school committee ethics policy a disagreement with all due respect with what he said. And I can't, I can't stay, I, I, I guess I can't support any type of disciplinary action against a member who has the right of free speech. You can always disagree with what they say and wish that they hadn't said it that way or that they hadn't expressed themselves that way, and in which case that would inform you the next time you go to the ballot box that you're like, that's not what I'm going to support. But um, one other thing I will point out here, and I'm interrupting myself, I just wish to point out that there's two different kinds of ethics violations. There's the ethics violation that this committee member, by the, I mean, that this person has brought up. And then there's the, the ethics violation that I think the member referred to, which is the state ethics vo code violation, the law. That's Chapter 268A of the Massachusetts General Laws. 
that would not, in my opinion, even come into play because that deals with conflicts of interest in terms of either appearance of or having an absolute, such as when Member Jovan um, excused himself because he, his wife works for the um, business that was competing for the contract. And that's generally what we think of as the classic um, ethics violation in terms of state law. In, indeed, the committee has its own ethics code that they wish to be bound by and held accountable for. And that is, I would say, um, while the state law can also be ambiguous and vague, at least we have some case law to go on, and that's informed us over the years as to how we should interpret that. In this instance, we have the document, and I'm not sure that we have had any situation in the past where we've had to really apply it to a situation, but I do view the policy as an overarching guide and a, a principle that people will live by. And even though there's a, a statement that says you have to follow the chain of command and you can't bring a complaint up outside of that, I don't think it means and, and I could be wrong because I didn't pass the policy and I've never been a school committee member. I've only been legal counsel to the school committee. I don't think it means that the committee member can't bring his, you could call it a concern, a complaint or whatever, in front of the others for deliberation. Because I think when you shut that down, then you no longer have a discussion right here. You then don't have anything and it's all behind the scenes. And I'm not really sure that that's ultimately what anybody in Southbridge or any community wants. They want to have some dialogue. They want to have some of it exposed so that they can make informed decisions about who they support, who they don't, issues that are brought to the attention of the superintendent and other members. So, in my view, it was an effort to bring up a topic, and I don't see it as going outside the chain of command to address that particular point. Um, and I could go on through each one of those, but I'm not sure that you want my interpretation of it anyway. I think what you're looking for is how they feel about it in terms of what you've raised, but again, they, I guess, have not seen what you brought to my attention. So I would have to say that maybe at a later time after they read it, they would be able to more intelligently address your concerns and how they actually fall under the rubric of the policy that they pass themselves. And that was my point last week to Ms. Quinney when, when, when I stated that on the face of it, there was a complaint issued, but with no other substantive, okay, m most of the time a complaint is, you violate, this is, I believe you violated this and this is under this section. For a school committee to rule, or anybody to take action, you would need specifics of that. Um, to say that it was ludicrous for me to say that ultimately elected officials are held accountable by the electorate, mm -hmm. that, that is in, in fact true. That is ultimately exactly how the electorate or the members of, the, of Southbridge should make its decision, informed and at the ballot box. And my only point to that is, this school committee has no authority to remove an elected person within its own body, correct? I don't, I, I'm not aware that it does. I think that the vacancy is only discussed in the policies that I've read anyway. Vacancy is discussed in the context of somebody who resigns or leaves, what? moves out of Southbridge. There's no provision within the town charter or within school committee policy to say, I don't agree with Mr. Lazo's opinion and I don't like the way he said this, so, what disciplinary action can a school body give outside of you said censure? I said censure because I think that's probably the most reasonable and I'm trying to understand what the citizen meant and I think most people are looking in terms of that as, a, as the correct way to address things, not, as not as a removal. Discipline. I didn't read it as a removal because I think had it been removal it probably would have said it in the okay. document. That's my interpretation. And, and, and that censure would have to come from a member of the body? Yes, and it would have to be a vote taken by the committee and it would come from the chair. Come but, from, well, through the, the chair. Through the chair, not yes, from not the chair, from be, through. Right, right. Correct, because yep. the chairman cannot make a motion. Correct. Okay, so it would have to come through somebody else on the body. Correct. Thank you. Mrs. Prince, did you have a question? Um, I do. I. There's so much verbiage this evening. I have a hard time following it all. And I don't know, I mean, we received this. It was also in the newspaper. Um, and you spoke, Aaron, last night at a town council meeting. And 
I'm trying to understand, if I may, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Lazo, what you meant by some of the things that you said, and I just want to read, and these are actual quotes. Taking away from the ones who do pay because of the ones who don't pay. It's always about the 70% free lunch, not about the 30%. It's unbelievable how discrimination just runs one way. That's probably the part that bothers me the most. That's the problem with society. We always cater to the bottom end, and I'm a Democrat. I want you to have the opportunity. I took offense to that statement also. And I want to give you the opportunity to explain what you meant. First, uh, if, if I'm allowed to do that. I, I, if Mr. Lazo wants to respond, that's Will up you? to him. But first, could you please cite for the public your source, just so it's on the record, the source for your quote was it a direct quote from the video? Was it an outside source? Was it on minutes of the meeting? Just for the public's knowledge. For the knowledge. public, it was in the Southbridge Evening News, which was a direct quote from the video. I did watch it also, and it seems accurate to me. Okay, I just want for the public to know that where the quote came from, that's all. Mr. Lazo, do you choose to respond to that? No, I, I'm, I'm pretty well done with the nonsense on this. I think our school district, uh, has so many positive things going for itself that it's a, a small group like this that derails a great movement of school committee uh, on a lot of the stuff that we're working on. So, you know, if anybody wants to quote the Southbridge News, the Telegram Gazette, um, whatever, uh, quote it. I, I respect their, their opinions. I respect what they did. I just, I just wish that they respected my opinion. You don't have to like it or whatever my opinion is on whatever subject it is. Uh, my bottom line is I don't have to explain to anybody except the voters. And I have explained my stand to the voters. And under unfinished business, I have another comment to my uh, uh, fellow voters and taxpayers of the town of Southbridge. My whole discussion on that... Well, Point. Just a question. Are you done answering her, her issue? Because the matter on the floor right now is Attorney okay. Rozak's presentation. I'm completely If, thank if you, you have another issue nope, on nope. unfinished, I'll take business. An unfinished business. Thank you, Mr. Lazo. Any further questions of Attorney Rozak on this? Dr. O'Leary? Uh, not a question specifically uh, to the attorney. Thank you. Um, more or less, uh, uh, the citizen, citizen had asked uh, that the school committee's. Uh, uh, response had, had wanted some of that. I am a member of the school committee. Uh, I, I'd like to take it, take an opportunity to speak. Sorry about all the feedback. Uh, so we have, and, and uh, as I get started, I will have my time to speak. Um, Miss, I hope the chairman will take his, use his latitude and um, keep uh, control of the situation. If people are going to interrupt me, please exercise your latitude to have them removed, if that's the case. Um, so we have public public input every time we have a meeting. It's welcome. We need it. It's part of the whole process. Uh, historically, you don't respond uh, in any kind of negative fashion to that. You don't have to agree with it. Like you said, we're elected officials. You're not going to agree with everybody. But what this has turned into to me, or what this came forward as to me, is uh, more or less a, uh, has uh, political undertones to it here in the election season. Um, with a small group of people, like we said, and it's a bit of a character assassination. So this, with my opportunity, is uh, my comment. I'm sitting, sitting next to a man who, for the past 18, 19 years, I think, has been intimately involved in uh, Pop Warner football here in Southbridge. Uh, times hundreds of children, hundreds of children, sometimes in a one year, I think 200 kids one year, uh, Many of these kids can't even afford the things, as Mr. Lazo had said, can't even afford the things to wear. This man has been a coach, an assistant coach, president of the league, on the board of directors, doesn't even have kids in the program anymore, yet every year, after year, every year, and every year, and every year, he's back there doing the same thing, giving things to, to this community and these children, many of which uh, can't afford to play, can't afford to do any of it. But he, here, here, Pop Warner does this. Here, Coach Lazo does this. Scott Lazo, your school committee guy, uh, does this. Every single year, uh, selflessly, 
um, talked about a number of things too. I, I could go on for a while about it, but it's it's just shameful to me that someone would, that really knows very little about uh, the history of it all can stand here and and have a uh, character assassination upon someone, and you're not allowed to respond because of decorum. Uh, and not only one week, three weeks in a row, have had to go through this. And then we have a citizen who, who demands to be heard, yet when a school committee member speaks, they think it's okay. What, what about fairness? Okay to interrupt the proceedings and say, oh, geez, what's this? Uh, you, didn't, you didn't see me doing that to anybody when they were speaking publicly publicly uh, as, as it should be. So I, I would ask, and actually I would demand the same kind of respect uh, from, from uh, those people that want to come up and speak um, for that to, to, to me personally. But to, back to the character assassination, this is a man who has a long history of uh, giving this to this community, especially to those uh, most in need. So for, for someone to, to put out that that's, that's not in his heart and in his mind is it, just... Uh, egregious to me. So uh, thanks for your time, Mr. Chairman and committee. Any further comments? Dr. Domenico? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to second everything that um, Dr. O'Leary has said. I feel it's a sad day in any community when uh, we have come so far. Uh, we, we are doing really well. We, we are all, uh, I, I really believe in my heart, trying to do what's best for this community. Um, to start engaging in, 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 um, in a movement that to me is clearly politically motivated and it's engaged against people who have done so much for this community. I'm not a lifetime resident here. I've been here for 10 years, 12 years. But I too know what he has done over the years that I have been here. And more, more to the point is sometimes being criticized by some people and I'm going to be very specific here, by some people, not all the people, who have done very little in this community, who have rarely had the courage to stand and be heard on a positive issue, to be constructive, to, to help out, to volunteer, to put hours in, to, to find financial solutions, to find any kind of solutions to our community problems, I, I feel it's not a courageous thing to do and come and criticize. It is not an easy thing to sit where we sit, none of us. If you have the audacity and the courage to be heard, you have to earn that. And I think Mr. Lazo in this town, and not him alone, has earned that many times over. Many times over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney uh, Rozak. Um, I don't think we have any further questions. I mean, I. I Thank you, uh, Ms. Quinney, for bringing this uh, Thank you. more detailed uh, information as, as far as that. I'd just like to echo one thing that uh, Attorney Rozak says, um, or as far as process goes. Um, many times at the school committee throughout the years, there are issues that school committee members uh, find out about that concern a great deal of, of students or staff. Um, and by bringing it to the superintendent's attention at a school committee meeting I don't think is inappropriate um, or violates a chain of command. Um, it's our opportunity to put those um, issues forward to our administrator and then seek his guidance for solutions. Um, Ms. Quinney states in one of these that, you know, Mr. Lazo had, had kind of made a comment about doing away with uh, the with, with, uh, one of them, or that was a point of uh, Mr. Motion. Um, actually, Mr. Lauzo had made a motion to circumvent the federal guidelines through the school committee at that meeting. That was his right to bring up a motion. He has a right to bring up a motion, whether, whether we agree with it or, or not, to say that uh, it wasn't seconded by the school committee. So obviously, he, he, he had, a, had an issue that he brought forward to, to the school committee and the staff and the administration felt strongly about it, made a motion before the body, and there was no second. Um, sometimes comments are, are go astray, and, um, but to, to bring matters before this body in a public meeting, I, I think is an appropriate uh, thing as long as it's done respectfully. I don't think we would be doing our, our jobs if we didn't let the public know in open sessions what goes on, because too often, um, 
I'm not going to rubber stamp everything that comes through because the superintendent said it. I mean, that's what got us in trouble before. You know, uh, you know we had a $3 million deficit on a, on a school alternative program because as an elective official, it was brought forward and we, sh we should believe the superintendent and, and, and approve everything they say. And it's no, this is no reflection on Mr. Ely, but as elected officials in the town of Southbridge, it's, it's incumbent on us as elected leaders to question certain things that go on in the school and, and make sure that what's going forward is appropriate. Um, and if it, that whole decision, and, and the problem with it is decisions are made by staff without coming forward through the process coming back up, the misinformation or not enough information to the school board because then we're the people that are in the public. This is what happens all the time. We're the elected leaders. I go to the grocery store. I'm out in the public. I go to schools. I go to fields. And people say, hey, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? Did you know? And we don't have any knowledge of it. And then we have kids that come up to us and say, you know what? They changed the whole breakfast program at the school. There was a, a, a group of students that, that I had a program with at the school. And Hey, did you know they changed the whole breakfast program at the school? And No, I didn't. And they said, well, we understood that it might have to be changed, but it would have been nice to let us know. So it's a two-way street for the, for the communication. Uh, I will take this under advisement, Ms. Queenie. We'll review it and uh, go forward on that. Um, moving on to other unfinished business district reconfiguration update, Mr. Ely. Yes, um, a letter has been written and is currently being in the process of being translated uh, that will go out to all the parents of elementary students for next year. Uh, it will tell them basically what, uh, what school they will, uh, their child will attend. Uh, I don't think it will have a bus number on it yet, uh, but it will basically tell them based on where they, their, we have their, as their address uh, where the children in that family will attend school in grades uh, uh, one through five, either Charlton Street or West Street, based on the, the, the map that uh, we adopted last week or la uh, two weeks ago. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, placed our regular teaching staff, and we have, uh, we're finalizing our placement of our special area teachers, our art, music, PE teachers, um, where they will be for next year. So that, uh, that's pretty final. Uh, I, I still have to meet with the, uh, uh, the union leadership just to let them know where those people are going to be for, for good. Uh, we also uh, are in the process of having uh, uh, some discussions about where we need our service providers, our Title I uh, reading and math, our special ed service, and our ELL services based on where the student population is for next year. Uh, so we, we are well on the way to meeting all the, the, the time frames that we set. Uh, we adopted the bus bid tonight, which has the bus routes. We'll start getting those together uh, with, with AA transportation and start putting bus numbers to, to those routes and, and pick up points and those sort of things. So I think over the next month or so, you'll see uh, that whole process be finalized. And hopefully by the, the time school's out, everybody will know, you know even what time they're going to be picked up and what bus uh, uh, they'll be riding uh, for the, to their school. Any questions? Seeing none. The ad hoc committee for the update with the maintenance department, Mr. Lazo, did you have anything? Um, I, have, I have no report at this time, but we uh, have been meeting with the town manager, and I think we sat down with the superintendent. <laughs> uh, we, we have some issues on the forefront, uh, some opportunities. I think we're going to have to review the chain of command to make sure that we uh, do the right process. But uh, I think Eric, uh, excuse me, the superintendent, myself, and uh, the committee will be fine. Um, I will have a report uh, at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Lazo. Uh, any update on accelerator improvement plan, Mr. Ely? I have a, a, uh, my monthly meeting tomorrow. Uh, it's called a highlight meeting that we have monthly with our, our monitor. Uh, we're impl fully implemented with our, uh, our new plan. Uh, we still have not gotten the written final approval on the plan. Uh, we had the verbal approval last time when Dr. Mitchell was here, but we still have not seen anything in writing to that, uh, to that effect yet. So I, I'm not holding my breath. Thank you. Any other unfinished business? Mr. Lazo? Uh, oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, to the chair, to the superintendent, I've been uh, getting some real concerns on the tours about the nurses' situation. I know we walked through the building and identified the offices and stuff. Uh, people are under the impression that it's going to be one nurse for both. I know the discussion was a nurse and a nurse's aide. Um, is, is there any way that we are going to have some sort of, is this 
Can you elaborate just a little bit on where we're going with this? I know um, I've heard different things. I just, I don't know if there's a meeting in the future or something that you can explain now on that. I mean, right now, we, 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 in our budget proposal to the school committee, we have a full-time nurse and a full-time nurse's, a, a CNA, a certified nurse's assistant, to be with that nurse on, all day. So we have two full-time positions in that area. Uh, we still, even from that budget, we have to cut $733,000 based on what the school, the, the town council has a, given us for an allowable increase over the current year budget. So even with those, that, that nurse and nurse's aid in the budget, we still have $733,000 to cut. I don't know where we're going to add. Uh, I, I don't think the conversation is going to be about adding over the next few weeks with the school committee when we have the budget meetings, and I'm guessing that we're going to have a budget meeting pretty soon. Uh, I don't know where we're going to be talking about adding things. We're going to be talking about cutting things, cutting things that we believe are, are really fundamental to what we do. Uh, okay. So, so that's where I'm thank, at. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it's a, a big concern uh, to the school committee. I know it's a concern to the building committee and everybody else. We have to uh, keep working on it. Well, it's a concern to us as well. I, oh, I know. I know it is. But $733,000 we have to cut. That's the flag. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one other issue uh, to this issue that has uh, reared its head and uh, it's in the paper and it's at the council meeting. I just want to put some closure to it as far as I'm concerned. As far as Ms. Quinney, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you because you do not make statements or sign anonymous letters. You sign them, you stand tall behind what you believe in, and that is a big plus in the town of Southbridge. You're not sneaky. You don't uh, do anonymous letters. You don't do anonymous blogs. You say what you mean, and you mean what you say. Whether it's correct or not, we can always debate, and I'm sure that we'll have discussions in the future. I, uh, I wish you the best. But my concern is public education, kids first, driving for excellence, and the employees. We're, a school, we're, we're in a position right now, there was a statement made that I'm backtracking. Obviously, you don't know Scott Lazo. He never backtracks. Uh, I think we're moving forward. I think as a district, the plan was, the mission was to go forward, not to go backwards, not to backtrack. We reconfigured grades one through five. A new middle high school, six through 12. Our, our, our um, kindergarten center at Eastford Road. Constantly striving to maintain these budgets, we balanced numerous budgets year in and year out. We've been fiscally conservative. Uh, I disagree as far as our negotiations are us and them. We have a professional relationship with the union. Um, maybe some people differ on that opinion. We're gonna continue to work together. To my fellow voters and taxpayers, I have a simple message. I've spent 28 years in government and as a volunteer in this town of Southbridge. Do not fall for the smoke and mirrors of a small group. <laughs> Make sure you do your homework and we get moving forward. Forget this small bickering over who said what and hold up a Southbridge news article, which I would never do at a school committee me uh, meeting. I don't think that's a proper document, but again, it's a big year ahead. We've got a lot of transition. The superintendent, the business manager, and this school committee does not have the time for the nonsense nor the feuding. So I will extend the olive branch to anybody that would accept it. Let's get to work and make this district the best it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Woodruff. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the um, superintendent, um, I believe several meetings ago I had asked for an update on the summer school program. Um, for the parents out there, and you had given me a, an answer to that, um, stating that the summer school program would be at the high school um, at the same time without any changes, and I believe now that there is an update that you have for us on the summer school program. I, I, heard that I received the summer school from the high school today, and I was at a meeting this afternoon for the collaborative, and I was not able to go open it and look at it, uh, but I will have something for you in your packet. Uh, I'll send something out Friday just an update on where we are. We are having a couple of special ed summer school programs for elementary students uh, at, at the elementary schools. It's been worked out with our maintenance departments. So they won't get in, in the way of the move. But primarily our middle school and high school will be running together a summer school program at the old high school on Cole Avenue. Uh, and uh, we'll have basically a, a program up there. We'll also have the food service program up there for the summer. 
so the students will be able to access a breakfast and a lunch, I think, up there during that time frame uh, for, for the summer school. So, uh, but I'll get you the details on the summer school uh, in, in your packet uh, this, this Friday. Okay, because I was informed that the summer school program is starting a lot earlier than it did last year. It's starting in June rather than in July. Um, For the elementary schools, I've, I've spoken to a couple there, of there parents. May be There may be some special needs programs that are starting that early. Okay. Uh, but it wouldn't be our regular summer school program. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gore? I, just have, I have a couple of things I'd like to, to say. The first thing I'd like to say is I, I also agree. I, you know, with this nurse issue, this was brought up by Mrs. McLaughlin a couple weeks ago, and it's been reiterated tonight. And I think that we need a couple nurses, personally. I know that money's very, very tight. I know that we don't have uh, any movement to move, any room to move, but I think we better make some room to move because I don't think that this is the, uh, the schools of the 1960s. I think you're gonna need a couple nurses. The second thing I wanna say is, earlier I made a statement that there is uh, animosity between the school committee at times and the uh, the union. I don't I don't take a step back from that. Uh, to take a step back from that would mean that I must be completely deaf and completely out of it when we have meetings because I've sat in meetings in those doors over there and I've listened uh, intently and I don't find this to be. Uh, as some people would say on this committee, healthful, dis health, healthy disagreements. Healthy disagreements are when you disagree on issues and that alone is the disagreement and you stay on task, you stay on that issue. Everything else is stays away from the issue, including personalities, including innuendos, including rumor, and all the other happy crap that should be outside of that issue at hand. That's not what happens here. And if these people on this, behind this uh, facade right here, say that that's what's going on, don't believe them. That's not, not what is going on. There is a lot of infighting. Of course there is. You have egos. You have people who don't agree. You have people moving around. You have people, you know, who want what they want. Do they, what they want, do they believe in their hearts that that's the correct thing and that's the right thing? Yes, they're not saying, I want this, I know this is bad for the town, but I want and I want it. No, that's not what's happening. What they want, they truly believe is for the best of the town. And I don't have a problem with that. If you stay on task, if you stay in what the issue is. When you go outside that issue and when you start going after the individual, and when you start talking in that type of terminology, I do have an issue with that. Because then you lose focus, then you waste time, then meetings drag on, then you lose everything. And that's what occurs. And for anybody to tell you differently, they're not telling you the truth. I've sat up here too long. I listened to over and over again of how there was these huge deficits and things and how this, you know, we magically just pulled together and, you know, what a team and that wasn't quite the way it worked out, folks. We made some good decisions and we made some crummy decisions, but in the end, it happened to work out okay. We put some good people in some good positions over the years. We got a couple good people, key people, that put us, you know, on the right track. And that's why we have arrived where we are today. It's not because we're a bunch of geniuses sitting up here. Believe you me, that's not what occurred here. We just made a lot of decent positions and listened to some people. And that was probably the biggest thing, probably the best thing that this committee ever has done is listen. Because when we're quiet and we listen, we tend to get things done. Thank you. Mr. Zigagori, I just don't want it characterized that we have an animosity with all unions. No, I, I didn't union, say that. The specific union, let's make it clear so the public knows, is the Southbridge Education Association. Sure. Teachers only. Okay, and, and, and yes, you, it may be characterized that um, there's personal issues. I have tried never to make it personal. But when I read in the blog some personal attacks at me based on union issues, that's wrong. Sir? That is wrong. We have to agree to disagree. And we make decisions every day relative to what's best for the district. And yes, some meetings go on a little too long. 
And maybe, maybe I haven't used the gavel as much, but I always thought I'd let people have their say to the point to, that we vetted it to the point that everybody's point was across. But I have a tremendous amount of respect for every member of that unit. Teachers have a tough enough job as it is every day in that classroom. And to let union issues get in the way because of personalities, that's wrong. We have to make decisions what's best for our kids. Because my kid sits in that classroom and I want the very best teacher and I want the very best equipment that they have. And I think over the last 10 years that I've been on the committee, I've tried to make the best decision I could make for the benefit of every kid, whether it's special ed, whether it's the high achiever, or the kid that's getting lost in the middle. The best decisions for teachers. And I will go to bat for any teacher, and I will agree to disagree, and I've always meant that. That's my personal opinion. And, you, and I respect your opinion, and we'll leave it at that, but I just want to make it clear that we have a very good working relationship with every single union. The SEA leadership right now does have an issue with us because of some of these decisions, but it's not all the teachers. And I respect every member of that unit. Is there anything further on unfinished business? Seeing none, new business. The next regular school committee meeting will be held on June 12, 2012 in council chambers. I also like to say under new business, did you have something? Yeah, go ahead, finish. Um, as far as the year, uh, I want to congratulate the Selfridge High School Yearbook Committee for the wonderful yearbook that they again put out. This was a, uh, something that's been done in-house uh, for the last several years to reduce the cost to our students. I think the staff up there does a, a wonderful job. Um, so thank you for that. Ms. Woodruff? Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to bring up a, a couple of things that um, came to mind today. Um, the first one is I would, um, through you to the superintendent, is I'd like the superintendent to take a look, um, especially for next year, with the reconfiguration on the pickup of children at Charlton Street School. I'm not sure how it goes at West Street, but um, I've been biting my tongue all year not to mention anything because I know the teachers and Mr. Montigny and Mr. Driscoll do a, a good job to keep it organized over there. But today, being that I almost got backed into by a Jeep, while waiting in the pickup line to pick up my son, um, I felt it um, something we need to look into, um, especially for next year with more children being over there. But at Charlton Street School, if no one knows yet, if they haven't been there, there's like a cul-de-sac where pick up, you start, and you go around, and you follow the one way, you stop at the crosswalk, pick up your child, and you proceed. Um, there are some parents who um, like to park their cars every which way and go across and park and then they are also using the cemetery as a drive through which to me is a little bit disgraceful to get out of the line quicker than anyone else and they are driving parking backing up and going the wrong way out the exit and today is not the first time I almost got hit but I'm just kind of fed up with that routine and I think next year it's going to be a bigger problem with more kids there and stuff so I'm hoping that maybe just bringing this up tonight I don't want to get anyone in trouble but I think we need to organize those pickups a little bit better so if we could perhaps work on um, that or perhaps I don't know blocking off at least blocking off the cemetery entrance because to have them driving in and out of the cemetery to pick up children to me is not appropriate I think we, we certainly will look at it with the bus company and you know, but you still gonna have. To, we don't have the authority to really direct traffic on the street, so we're gonna have a tough time. We we'll have to get the police department involved, and if they want to block a street off or something like that. Uh, but through it all, we're not gonna be able to create more space there. That 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 space is limited, as we mm -hmm. know, uh, by the virtue of way the way it's laid out. Uh, and and uh, I too have been over there at the end of the day, and it can be mass chaos as it is around a lot of our buildings that time of day. So we'll we'll definitely look at it with our bus company and make sure. But ultimately, parents are going to have to be respectful of each other and and, and travel in a, a traffic pattern that we establish. Correct. Thank you. And um, my other subject for this evening is the sped department. Um, we haven't had any updates all year. 
um, from the SPED department, especially because we started the new programs or the new setup for the SPED as we had the ABC groups, everything included, no resource rooms, that kind of thing. And um, I would love it if before the end of the year that we could get a, a little update from the teachers, maybe a couple parents, and of course Mr. Myers, to see how all that went this year with the new mm -hmm. configuration that we did yep. with them this year. Yeah, we actually have some teachers coming to, to talk to you at the next meeting, but it's more about math and ALA, but I'll, I'll have some, some things set up for you. I know Mr. Meyer was, was uh, ready to do a presentation, and we had to cancel him because of some other things that came up uh, a, a month or a month and a half ago or so. So he's, he's ready to give a presentation. Great. Thank you. Any further than new business? I just want to congratulate all the seniors that will be graduating uh, on June 3rd, uh, as we will not have a meeting before then. Uh, going to be great. They're going to be the last class to graduate from the existing high school. Uh, and uh, it's really a bridge to our new future. Um, I wish them all the best of luck and look forward to seeing them on graduation day. School committee reports, curriculum subcommittee. Uh, nothing to report. However, there is a curriculum subcommittee on June 4th at 6 o'clock in the Hyman. Thank you. Thank you. Policy, Mrs. Woodruff. Uh, no reports and no meetings at this time. Budget facilities and transportation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the plan was to schedule the meeting of the uh, committee as a whole to right. discuss the budget reduction. Correct. I was going to bring that under unfinished business. I lost yep. track. Um, Mr. Ely, at what point will you have the recommendations between you and the business manager and the administrators to present to the school committee for vetting so that we can make the appropriate adjustments to the account as we did vote a bottom line budget, but the only way that the budget can be changed is through school committee vote? At what point will you be available to make that presentation to the school committee? Tomorrow. Late tomorrow. Late tomorrow. So you're going to be sending. We're, we're ready. You're going to be sending Friday. a recommendation to us. We'll send you a recommendation on Friday, yep. and then if you want to set a meeting up after that, we yep. certainly we're ready. We'll set a meeting for next week. Yep. Um, uh, what's today? Is a consensus what's that? From the committee. Uh, to, Friday. Uh, Why don't we set it for this Friday? Tuesday. I'm going to be here on the 29th, the 20, uh, 30th, 31st. First. Uh, 30th is a special building committee meeting, but that'll be quick. You want to do that after that? 30th at 7 p.m. May 30th at 7 p.m. I'll have it posted. Does that work for you, Dr. Domenico? 30th, I believe that's Tuesday. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. No, this is a special school committee. Committee oh, meeting of the whole. I'm reluctant to do it Friday because it's a long weekend, so many people will be out of town. You want to do it on the 30th at 6? Well, we'll do it at, at 7 because there's a special building committee meeting, you said? Yeah. Are we, at what but time? That's at 5. Are we, are we at 5? Sure. At 5. Probably building. can do it at 6 because I don't think it's going to take us long. You want to do it well, at 5.30? We'll, we'll go to one item on the building committee, special building committee. Can we do it at 5.30? No. Six. No. Some of us have jobs that we, we take out Real of jobs? Boston that really have Real to, jobs. can't make it here. At Real jobs? 6.30 on May 30th. 6.30? 6.30. Okay. Well, I just got to get it posted. Thank you. Collective bargaining, Mr. De uh, Mr. Lazo. Mr. Digbrook? Yeah, Mr. Lazo. Uh, no report at this time. I, I would just like to make a quick comment. I know Dave's uh, really, he's not wrong with what he's saying. The thing is, we have the right to disagree, and uh, we don't have to hate each other. And things aren't always as rosy as they look, I agree. Negotiations is the toughest subcommittee to serve on. Uh, you're the guardian of the, of the dollars to make the budget work, and I don't hold any union or any unit um, in any type of animosity when they come forward asking for benefits and stuff. That's what they're supposed to do. And I do not uh, label the, the union as one. I really do look at our teachers individually. Um, some units have stronger leadership, some have not so strong leadership, but we still have to deal in good faith. Dealing in good faith is the art of give and take, and I think we do that, and then when something happens that's not in good faith, creates the animosity, and I'm sure that we both sides have had their fair share of moments. But we have uh, no meeting scheduled uh, as of now. Building committee. Mr. Chairman, I was uh, very happy to to see the largest tour of Southbridge High School, it's 125 parents, children. Uh, we had a lot of former teachers from the old Southbridge High um, that are no longer teaching showed up. 
I would like to thank the chairman, Jack Jovan, uh, Mike Walker of the uh, Sigley Company, and uh, William Bishop, the administrator. We had to split, the tour was so big, we had to split it into three sections. Uh, and Mr. Bishop took one, Mike Walker took one, Jack Jovian took one, and we toured the building. It is absolutely moving at the quickest pace. Um, again, our next uh, tour is gonna be June 16th, 2012, nine o'clock. Um, and I know that if anybody has seen it, it is truly, truly a jewel uh, for the town of Southbridge. Thank you. Thank you. General item 15, vote to go in executive session for one, discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining for union, non-union personnel litigation to the extent that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the governmental body pursuant to Chapter 30A, Section 21, Part 3. So motion. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Domingo? Yes. Mr. Joe Mann? Yes. Seven, yes. School Committee will reconvene an open session for the purposes of German only. Thank you and have a good night.